to be in God's house, and it's so good to hear people uh, in the testimonies here tonight, giving God thanks for everything. Some people don't consider, uh, Mama, that the Lord can help you when something's lost, He can help you find it. When something's needed, He can help supply it. And that song Mama referred to, thank you for reminding me, Lord, uh, how you uh, touched my, touch my eyes and let me see. And thank you for letting me <coughs> see and be and understand uh, the body of Christ. Yes. What a great place God has given us, Sister Roman, yes. that we can grow in God. Yes. Uh, matter of fact, we're not only can, we're supposed to. You know, it's a sad thing, isn't it, to see someone have a child and then uh, as they're growing, they all of a sudden they notice that they're not developing properly. And uh, after a while, you see their, their growth, they're, they don't start growing physically, they don't start growing mentally. You know, and they have to be taken care of their entire life, and they usually have a short lifespan. With God's children, we're to grow. We're not to, uh, he said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And we grow in grace and in knowledge and in wisdom and in understanding and in counsel and all of those things that are connected with God's Holy Spirit. We're to grow individually and then we're to grow as a church. Appreciate the growth that's in the church. You could have a house full of people and every one of them be immature or not have any spiritual growth to them. But you can have just a handful of people and have overcomers in it. That's amazing. We have to be careful that we don't look at our own abilities and strengths. When Gideon had several thousand people, he thought he had too many. And God told him, said, you tell the those that are fearful and afraid to go home. And then he uh, said, you still have two men. And he said, go down and have them drink water. And those that laughed like a dog, and then those that took water in their hand and drank, and they were he said, that's the ones I want, the ones that vigilant and sore. They ended up with 300 out of thousands. And what could 300 do against an army that was stretched out like grasshoppers across the plain? Well, God told them, he said, here's what you do, Gideon. So you take a, 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 a pitcher and put a, a light inside of it and you take a trumpet and give one to every man. It was kind of amazing that 300 people knew how to blow a trumpet. <laughs> First time I picked up a trumpet, Sister Lawanda, I couldn't hardly make any sound at all. I learned to play it after practicing, but just to hand me a trumpet and say, blow it, it's, it's not as easy as you think. But apparently, God gave them the ability to blow a trumpet. And they told them to surround the enemy on the hillside. And when you hear the, the shout go forth, the, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon be upon you. Said, so break your pitcher and blow your trumpet and holler that out. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon be upon you. And when they did, they enemy seen those 300 lights and thought there was thousands with the sound and could be God magnified that sound coming through with the voices and the blowing of the trumpets 
and they began to kill one another and began to flee. And uh, Gideon's men had a great victory. Well, there's to be a light in your vessel. He said, you are the light of the world. And it takes power to make a light. You know, uh, something that has no energy at all is darkness. But in order to have uh, light, there has to be power there. Like these lights here, there, there's a power plant somewhere sending out energy. Comes through the, the wiring, comes through the transformers, comes down the wires to the filaments in these bones. You know there's power that comes from God. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Power to shine. Power for people to see God in you. He said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. Well, we're not trying to be hid. We're set on a hill. Brother David, we're set on the highest place of the city. Mount Zion. And it's for people to see God. But then there's to be a message. Everybody is to be able to speak for Jesus. Blowing that trumpet, Israel had certain things they would do. When the enemy would come, they had watchmen on the wall. And they'd blow a trumpet a certain sound. And the people knew which wall to go to. They knew which direction the enemy was coming from. Sometimes they'd blow a trumpet of assembly. They knew to gather together and which, which direction to go. But we're to have the word of the Lord within us. That you can sound an alarm to your loved one. You know, a minister can't get around to everybody and speak to everyone, and you can't speak to everyone. There's nobody that can speak to everyone, but you can speak to those that you have influence with, those that you meet, those that you talk to. Smith Wigglesworth was a Pentecostal minister in the early part of the last century and he had a lot of credits as far as praying and people being healed God helped him that way but he'd go out and stand on a street corner praying people walking up and down he'd pray God would you show me who to witness to he said he'd feel the Holy Ghost and he'd open his eyes and there would be somebody walking and God would let him know, talk to this person. You know, you can talk to a lot of people and don't do any good. But if you talk to a heart that's open, that's hurt, that's wounded, that's hungry, that's desiring, just a few words and cause that individual's life to change. And he said many times they'd be kneeling at the curb, praying that person through to salvation and sometimes the Holy Ghost. Well, that light <coughs> and that power that's within us, you might say, well, I'm not a minister. I don't have power. That's not what the scripture said, is it? He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you if you're a minister. He doesn't say that, Mama. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you. Now, the ministry has power, but the saints have power. Every individual. You know, it's power to be able to talk to God and know He hears you and He answers. If God answers in the little things, you know he will answer in the big things. If God cares enough to supply your daily need, give us this day our daily bread, and you turn around and thank him for it. 
Don't you know he'll supply your big needs? He'll take care of you? And so it is with the body of Christ. God hears our prayers collectively. Now, if God hears you when you pray, and God hears me when I pray, every one of us, can you imagine what it does for all of us to pray the same thing? And pray together. And direct praise and prayer. Brother Whitlow, Brother William Whitlow, talked on prayer a lot. He said, when you pray, he said, always add prayer, I mean praise with your prayer. Don't just ask God to do this and ask God to do that. But worship Him and praise Him. Now that's what we do when we come together and we call it church. We begin to sing praises. We want to stand up and pray first and ask God to help. Ask God to bless and come in our midst. Supply the needs of the church in this service. Every service we have needs. And then the songs of Zion start. And we begin to worship the Lord. We begin to thank Him. Uh, thank you, Lord, for reminding me I'm in the body of Christ. You know, sometimes you have to be reminded who you are and where you are. Everybody, if you're normal, which everybody is pretty normal, we get the feeling we're nobody. I'm nobody. Or the church, we're nobody. We're no big thing. God's not looking for a big thing. You think God's looking for something big? What is this world got that is big? The only thing is a humble person down on bending knees worshiping God. That's the only thing in this world. When, when uh, the angels came to Abraham and said, we're going to go down and investigate what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to destroy the city for the wickedness thereof. And Abraham said, well, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? He said, yes. Now that was a wicked city. He said, well, if there's 40 righteous, would you spare it? They said, why, well, yeah. He said, how about 30? If there's 30 righteous, and there had to be thousands of people living there in that Twin Cities. And they well, were very wicked. He said, yes, for 30. He said, great venture, 20. If there's 20, he said, no, we won't destroy it if there's 20 people living there. He said, well, let me ask one more time. If there's 10 righteous, would you destroy the city or would you save it? They said, if there's ten righteous, we'll save it. There wasn't. But do you know what God does when he destroys evil? He delivers his righteousness, his righteous children. During the flood, someone said, God destroyed the world with the flood. No, he didn't. He saved the world with the flood. God saw how wicked man was and he was going to destroy all of it. But he said, no, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you know you have found grace in the eyes of God? So when God destroyed the Andalusian world, he built an ark and saved Noah and his family. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel said, 
Lot, get up and get out of the city because we cannot do anything until you're out of here. Well, angels are pretty powerful. They killed 100,000 in one night. One death angel did. But they said we can't do anything. That means God has, was holding them back from destruction, destroying them cities, until the righteous were removed out of it. So Lot got up, his wife and his two daughters, four people. It wasn't 60, it wasn't 50, it wasn't 40, it wasn't 30, it wasn't 20, it wasn't 10, it wasn't even five. Four people. And his wife looked back and she was destroyed. We're in a time and going into a time of judgment when our world is going to be destroyed. Not by water, but by fire this time. Man made destructions. But God will spare his children. He'll make a ark, a place of safety. And I'm not talking about going out and building bomb shelters or, you know, some some type of apparatus like that that you move in underground. I'm talking about God protecting you. When Israel was destroyed in AD 70, the message had already been preached. Christ had preached it. The apostles, no doubt, preached it. He said, when you see the armies come past Jerusalem, don't go into the city, but flee to the mountains. That's where Lot went. Lot fled to the mountains. That's where the angels had him head and go to. And so when the Roman armies come past Jerusalem, do you know there were some that were caught inside the gates? But history says that for some unknown reason, Titus's army backed up for three days. And anybody that wanted to left the city. And when they came back, nobody left the city said, better were they that died of hunger. And better were they that died of the sword than they that died of hunger. Deuteronomy said, I'll burn them with hunger and send them to the lowest hell. Or their rejection and murder of God's Son. In our near future, God is going to deliver from behind the walls of Babylon any children that will come out. But you know, I know human nature, and I'm sure you do too. I'm going to say there were some that knew that message and still held to the safety of the city of Jerusalem and didn't come out and die there. So anytime God has destroyed a nation, a city like Sodom and Gomorrah, a nation like Israel, or a world like the Andalusia, he's made a way for the righteous. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Have no fear. Don't be afraid. God makes a way. He's the way maker. He will make a way for you in the darkest night. In the most severe times, God will protect his children. Don't you know a thousand can fall to your left and ten thousand to your right and no harm come to them? They threw Paul and Silas in the jail. Said, and while the blood from their backs was running down, the prisoners around them heard them saying, Oh, we're going to higher ground. And the jail door opened. And the guard.
guard started to kill himself because he thought they all escaped. Paul said, do thyself no harm. We're still here. And do you know he went in and washed their feet, fed them, and was converted to Christianity. The jail people. Peter was in jail. A, a band of soldiers. And one on either side, and it looked like he was chained to them. Because they had killed uh, James, the Apostle James. And they saw it pleased the people, so they were going to kill Peter. But an angel came. They were praying to deliver Peter, Lord, deliver Peter. The angel came, smote him on the foot and said, Get up, Peter. Peter thought he was dreaming. The shackles just fell off. He got up and started following this angel, and all these soldiers is asleep. God's got a way of delivering. And it said he went to the, the prison doors, and the gates just opened on their own accord. And he walked out, was out in the street, and the angel left, and all of a sudden he realized it wasn't a dream. He went to the house and knocked on the door. The little damsel came and said, Who is it? He said, It's Peter. And she ran back inside and said, Hey, Peter's outside. They're in there praying the Lord to deliver him. And they said, No, can't be Peter. He's in prison. No, I heard him. He's standing at the door. <laughs> no, nah, we don't believe that. Boy, what? It's kind of like the little boy that said they were praying. The church is having a drought, Sister Lawanda. And they said, come, come to prayer meeting Thursday night. We're going to pray that God will end this drought and give us rain. And said, out of all the people that showed up, there was one little boy that brought a number up. <laughs> The rest of them didn't bring umbrellas. Oh. And out of all the praying that they were doing for God to deliver Peter, they didn't believe it when it happened. <laughs> they had to open the door and said, oh, it's just his spirit. It can't be him. Amen. They didn't believe God oh. would or could, could or would, one of the two answer their prayer. Oh. You know, we're to believe in God when we pray. Don't you know that God can deliver you at, from anything at any time? Right. Have faith in God. Yes. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches over his yes. own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith. Have faith in God. Yes. Oh my. So we have an understanding of some of the horrific events that's coming to our world it's going to be destroyed the world that we know but if God be with you who or what can be against you so I appreciate the Lord for letting, him letting us have faith and trust him have no fear said, Jesus will perish in here. He said, oh, ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. You know your faith can be little. He said, peace be still. It means more than to believe that Jesus is. It means to serve him, to love him. I'm sure everybody here knows that Adam and Eve believed in God. They knew there was a God. They had talked with God. And he walked with them in the cool of the garden. They believed in God. But they were disobedient. They were, they, they had unbelief in God's will. 
Do you know you can believe there is a God and not believe in His will? There's no question that Adam and Eve knew there was a God. Now God said we're not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They knew God. They believed in God. The world hangs their hat on the saying, if you believe in God, you'll be saved. But you've got to know what that entails. It's more than just believing there is a God, but it's knowing God and understanding God and believing in God's will. God has a will for you. It's not his will that any should perish, but there's a lot of people perish. Yeah. Brother Garland said, out of all the billions of people that live, there's just a few that are called Christians. And out of the few that are called Christians, there's just a little group that believe in salvation. And out of the, the few and the little, there's a tiny group that believe in Holy Ghost baptism. And out of that few little tiny group of people, there's an insignificant I don't know how small you could go with it, but there's a group that understand God, and that's part of the body of Christ. People want to count numbers. There's 8 billion people in the world today. 8 billion. How many do you think are Christians? How many? Very few compared to the billions that live. The body of Christ. Someone said the body is bigger than you think. Well, our group of people, we, we could probably muster up, I don't know, 100,000 maybe? In every body, in every church? 100,000. But let's say, it was 10 million. What's 10 million compared to 8 billion? 8 billion is 8,900 million. No, 7,900 million that aren't in the body if 10 million was in the body. I don't know where I'd rather date it at this present point. There's 10 million in the body. Said, so all your church is little. Well, I belong to a little group of people. It's a little group of people that's going to heaven. It was a little group of people that got on the ark. It was a little group of people that left Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a little group of people that got out of Jerusalem alive. It's a little group of people that make the bride. So that's 144,000. That's stretched over 6,000 6, years. From the time in the Old Testament all the way up to the time of the catching away of the bride. That ain't very many people. Lord, Help us to see and remind us who we are. Remind us, dear God. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where